Distinguished and eminent moderator, Dr. Rajita Kulkarni, President Sri Sri University. Let's put our hands together, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome ma'am. I also have the privilege in inviting our eminent panelists for the session, Dr. T. Sashi Prabha, Vice Chancellor, Satya Bama Institute of Science and Technology. A very warm welcome. Dr. Ram Sharma, Vice Chancellor and Chairperson, Board of Management, UPES. Very warm welcome, sir. Dr. Vishal Talwa, Director, IMT, Ghaziabad. Warm welcome to you, sir. Dr. Ramakrishnan Raman, Vice Chancellor, Symbiosis International University. Dr. Ranjan Bose, Director, Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology, Delhi. Mr. Richard McCallum, Group CEO, UK India Business Council. And also joining us is Dr. Nidhi Pundeen. She is Vice President, Global CSR and Director, HCL Foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished moderator for this session, Professor Rajita Kulkarni, is a successful banker turned educator, a best-selling author, a global thought leader, and a transformational leadership coach. She is currently holding the fellowship following prestigious positions, Pre President Sri Sri University, Trustee Sri Sri Ravi Shankar Vidya Mandir Trust, Member Board of Governors Sri Sri University, Sri Chairperson Sri Sri Ayurveda Hospital and Research Center, Director SSU Innovation Foundation, represents Indian universities on the Court of Indian Institute of Science Bangalore for the Quadrennium 22 to 25 awarded with the Certificate of Plantation by QS India Summit in July 2023. QS has also planted a tree in her name. Has been recognized as one of the top academic leaders of India by Center for Education, Growth and Research, CEGR, India's largest think tank on education in April 2023. Fiki Flow Trailblazers Women Achievers Award 2023 by Fiki Flow Mumbai in March 2023. Iconic Women Creating a Better World for All Award presented at the Women Economic Forum on 27-31 December 2022 at New Delhi. Also was awarded the Exceptional Woman of Excellence Award at Global Women's Economic Forum, to name a few. And she also won 17 awards for professional excellence in a professional career in city between 1992 to 2010. A truly accomplished um, moderator we have, ladies and gentlemen, today here with us. Also, the last thing that I would like to sh share with all of you is her recently authored book, The Unknown Edge, has become a bestseller number one in the True Accounts category on Amazon. Congratulations, ma'am. And may I hand over to you to kindly carry forward the proceedings of the session, Institutional Social Responsibility, Allying Values with Actions. And um, I would request you to kindly conclude, try to conclude in one hour or one hour, 10 minutes, as a lot of our delegates and participants have flights to catch. Over to you, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, this is the last session of the day and the last session of the conference. And I think the stellar panel that I have, I would like to thank Fiki for keeping the best for the last. And uh, I think uh, what is very significant uh, for us is that we began the conference with the discussion on SDGs. And we are ending the conference with a discussion on institutional social responsibility. So congratulations for uh, Dr. Vidya, you and the whole team for curating this in a way where both the bookends are about something more than just academics, which of course the last two days have been about. I think it's been fantastic conversations, lot of thought provoking ideas, discussions, debates, uh, the last one on accreditation, benchmarking, on risk compliance, on globalizing, internationalization, technology in education. And today, in this panel, we are talking about something more than just the business of education. Uh, we are going to talk about what is our larger responsibility to the communities we belong to, to the society we belong to, to the nation we belong to, and to the world we belong to. So. 
the panel we have here is fantastic. We have three vice chancellors, two directors, and one representing the private sector from the CSR angle. And with a wealth of knowledge from not just knowledge and experience, not just in India, but from around the world. So all those of you who have stayed back, I think congratulations to all of you seekers of knowledge and uh, chasers of ideas. And I'm sure this will bring you a wealth of uh, ideas and information on what we as institutions need to do for our nation. You know, I belong to Sri Sri University. We owe our parentage to the Art of Living Foundation whose purpose of existence is service. In Hindi, we say seva. In Sanskrit, we say seva. That means doing without expecting anything in return. So in Shishi University, for us, the three core values are learn, lead, and serve. So service is one of the three core principles or values with which we live our life on our campus. We conduct. Uh, uh, ourselves on our university, in our university. So that that is where we come from. And I think that we have seen how that designs and defines our life on campus. Something more and above and beyond just the daily, uh, you know, uh, the, the daily life on campus as, as we spend. So today I'm going to invite, we will do this in a free flow uh, method. I'm going to invite each of uh, the panelists to say make opening remarks of two, three minutes. And then we'll have a conversation around that. We have some questions prepared for you and also some exciting uh, ways for all of you as audience to participate. So we end the conference with a bang. What do you say? Yes, so that all of you who have stayed back, I think, get, go back with a big resounding memory. So to start with, uh, uh, OK, we are with a bang already. Uh, so Ranjan, can I start with you uh, from that side? Do you have a mic there? Ah, yeah. So maybe a couple of minutes, your opening thoughts on this topic. Hello, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much uh, for that introduction. So the opening remarks basically focuses on our relevance here today. Coming from an institute of higher education, we have basically a triple helix. Educational institutes of higher education are basically supposed to do research. They're supposed to do teaching or education. And also, in today's day and age, entrepreneurship. So there is a triple helix out there today research, education, and entrepreneurship. And this is how uh, the education institutes have to contribute today. But looking at the way things are moving, there's a fourth pillar that needs to be added, which is social responsibility. And that's why this session is so relevant. So if you look at the lens that we have today, the higher education lens, it is to create a multiplier effect. And one of the important things that higher education institutes must do is to see where they can add value. So let's look at the education part. It is simple enough. We need to educate. We need to educate our next generation to understand the challenges that we face today and what is the social responsibility that our students have for tomorrow. That is number one. Number two is research where the real multiplier effects takes place. And we must ensure that a part of your research effort actually goes into addressing some of the challenges, uh, the climate change challenge, the pollution challenge, the sustainable city kind of challenge. All the SDGs, if you map them, you can see research angles at all of those places. Finally, entrepreneurship is the way to scale up the solutions. And that's where we have to play a critical role here today. So I'll uh, pause here and let the other panelists speak. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Ranjan. And uh, the, the three pillars of research, education, and entrepreneurship, and how we can link that to institutional social responsibility. Very well uh, articulated. Uh, Dr. Ramkrishnan, your opening remarks. Thank you so much. So institutions, social responsibility, aligning values with actions. 
The higher education system today is uh, ensuring that students add value and get jobs, or add value and create their startups, add value and a minority of them go for research. Now, if you look at any student who's uh, pursuing his or her higher education program, majority of them are focusing towards getting good jobs. So if, you're, you have, if, if, they, if the institution is going to give them good jobs, then the institution becomes popular. This is the scenario in India. And hence, you've got some schools which are very popular, some schools which are not so popular. So uh, as I look at the requirement from the students from the value-add point of view, they generally look out for good placements, prospects, package, profile. That's the four piece for them when they look out for any specific institution which they are going to join. Now, how can we instill the concept of social responsibility in them? You go to any engineering school, B school, law school, or any other school, you generally have a, a set of students who will form a club, or there could be a department which is actually focusing and ensuring that uh, they instill the concept of social responsibility in the students, and they might do several activities. It could be the joy of giving week. Some of, some of them do it, collect something, give it. But uh, it'll be great if the institution is looking at something which is sustainable. Many corporates and many educational institutions jump into it and do something if there is a crisis. Oh, if there is a flood, let me collect something and donate. If there is an issue, let me go and pitch in something so that I can support, which is all good. But if higher educational institutions are looking at something which is sustainable, which is taken as a project by the students, and it's carried on batch after batch, which can create a great change in the society and can create an impact, that will be good. A few institutions and few universities do this, but not many of them. Many of them actually are looking at only this as a very uh, short-term project in terms of crisis. So how can this be done? This can be done if you're going to have something which is connected to their academic. Telling that, if you are involved in something like this, that will not only do good, but it will help you in the process of your journey of learning and possibly creating your own startup or getting placed. Can we have credits for them? Can there be credits which is like a multiplier? If it is a zero, then possibly it will be an end result which is zero. But if you are able to go and get something there, only then you can graduate. If higher educational institutions are instilling something like this, then for sure it will have a, a, a palpable impact in the way the higher education institutions are contributing through their students and instilling uh, the sense of social responsibility in them. So that, that's my take. Yeah, thank you. Very nice, Dr. Ramakrishna. So you are challenging us to think about how we can help students transition from above the 4P to a more sustainable perspective to nation building, to contributing to society and how that can start getting integrated in the way we conduct academics. Very nice. Uh, Richard, you come from a business council perspective. And you are sitting with a, a, a set of academicians here. What yeah. are your thoughts on this topic for academics? I'm feeling like the odd one out here. Huh? I'm the only one without a doctorate, I think. <laughs> um, yes, thank you, Ajita, and thank you very much to Fiki for this opportunity. Um, I am um, a little bit of a, a different animal on this panel. Um, we, um, we, the UK India Business Council, are a membership organization of about 100. UK and Indian companies. Um, we exist to help British companies and universities to succeed in India, and increasingly to help Indian companies and universities succeed in uh, the UK. Um, we, we help uh, both governments make better decisions, so lots of advocacy work. And we also help um, companies and universities to set up in India and um, navigate this market. So um, why am I here? We have a very thriving group of UK universities within, our, within the council. I think we have about 17 UK universities. And about 10 years ago, we set up something called the University Corporate Partnership. And the UCP, as we call it, is focused on bringing industry and academia together for better outcomes, including um, SDG outcomes. Um, that's things like industry, academia, um, 
partnerships, it's like industry-funded PhDs, um, better employability prospects and skills, and so on. And I can talk about that a bit later on. Um, but also, I'm very keen to put um, higher education front and centre of what we are doing in the UK India Corridor. Um, I think it's the sort of, not just the movement of people between these two countries, but also the potential for technology collaboration, for example, is critical to the future of this relationship. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, great, Richard. So how you, we will hear more from you on how you are driving that for better SDG outcomes. Vishal from IMT Ghaziabad, you run a, a very, very popular and successful business school. So tell us about how you look at institutional social responsibility and in IMT what is happening. Thank you, Vaik. Um, <coughs> very kind of <clears throat> So thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to the panel. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about IMT, but at the same time I'll talk from the perspective of a standalone um, management institution or a standalone um, higher education institution. Uh, which in a way now is reconnecting a little bit more to the original idea for why management schools came along, right? So if you look at the 50s and the 60s, one of the big reasons why management schools came along was to have certain public value. There had to be certain social value, public value. And of course, in the last many years, we, we ten, tended to move in a direction which uh, made us um, restricted in how we competed. It made us restricted in how we kind of looked at, let's say, our students, and how our students looked at us, um, you know, over a period of time, got measured on a particular metric, you know, for example, placement or, or things on those lines. But of course, over the last many years, whether it's certain headwinds externally, whether it's internally within the higher education system, whether it's new education policy or whatever else, I think a lot of now reconnection and re-engagement is now taking place with respect to why do we exist as a higher education institution? What was the original reason for us to do that? And the original reason is very simple, right? To be able to be meaningful um, and to matter to a larger base of you know, population. And I think uh, what we are now doing, possibly in a lot many times in, in, in higher education institutions, we tend to do it. We tend to do a lot of activities. We tend to do things which we kind of club as uh, CSR activities or doing social good, but it's only now we're thinking about it in more integrated fashion, right? We're now thinking about it, how do I bring that into my teaching? How do I bring that into my research? How do I bring that into the ethos and the DNA of the whole system, right? So now whether you look at it from a standpoint of ensuring that the curriculum, uh, you know, is, is being able to be uh, modified, looked at, or at the core being integrated with this whole reason for existence, whether it is the kind of research areas that you're trying to identify, uh, whether it is um, this whole idea of encouraging a lot of your faculty um, you know, to be able to shape the direction of where they would like to go. Right? So whether it is around uh, certain uh, interventions that they would like to do in society, whether it's certain interventions that they would like to do from a research standpoint. Uh, otherwise, what happens in normal business schools is that uh, people or a think tank who are thinking about, let's say, society and social responsibility and what is it that we should be doing, are usually a few and far between, right? Um, they're there, but usually on the periphery. So one or two people, they may not be able to change the system. As long as there's no support, as long as more and more people are not brought in at the core to be able to shape the direction. Um, so that's essentially my initial thoughts uh, on this. Maybe later I'll talk a little bit more, more about the activities and the things that we do. Thanks, Vishal, wonderful. You have gone to the core and asked us to think about what is the purpose of our existence? and how do we matter to a larger base of population. I think as educators, very, very core to our existence to think about these questions. So from there, uh, uh, Vishal, could you give the mic? So from the north of Ghaziabad, we move now, Shashi, to you to the south. Chennai, you run a large technology institution, 20 plus thousand students. How does institutional social responsibility, is it, how is it embedded for yes. you in yeah. your institution? What are your thoughts? So very good evening. So thanks, Vicky, for this opportunity. And my uh, moderator and co-panelist and all the delegates who are sitting here. So it's a very important topic. Institutional social responsibility aligned with the institutional values and actions. It was nicely coined, as my moderator was telling. And if I say about 
Uh, just I take an example of our own institution, Satyabama Institute of Science and Technology, which is one of the premier institutions of South India. The institutional values, every institution has got its own values, core values. Our institution has got seven core values. So we call it as INSPIRE. I for integrity, N for nobility, and S for sustainability, P for partnership and collaboration, and I for inclusion and diversion, and R for responsibility, and the E for excellence. So this is the core value of the institution. And all the actions, or all the activities, right from academics, research and innovation, is orienting towards these core values. And our actions are based on these core values and the vision of the institution. Finally, it is orienting towards the uh, vision of the institution. So if you say, since uh, most of our programs are technical programs, and we are providing the opportunity for our students to improve the livelihood of the nearby community and the adopted villages or the adopted government schools. We are trying to improve their quality of education in the adopted schools and we are trying to improve the livelihood in the adopted villages through the technological intervention. We are inviting this component in our curriculum as community internship. So all the students in the engineering students of an institution has to do either the community internship or they have to do the industry internship. In that way, we are imbibing the social responsibility on the students. This is the one way. And other way, we all know that the funding agencies are funding the institutions a lot. The crores and crores of public money is spending on the research projects, which is getting executed by the institutions in our country. And we do not know how many of these signs, what we are doing in the institutions is reaching the society. It is stopping with the reports. It is stopping within the publications or monographs or finally maybe the book, books. So we should be more responsible as a leaders of the institution or as a implementers of these projects. We should be responsible and we should see to that this science or technology, what we are developing, should reach the community immediately. Okay, that is in the hands of the institutions. And we have to take it very seriously because we are not talking about academics. So we are all, we know we have to improve the academics. We have to excel in our academics and research and innovation. At the same time, we have to implement the ESR activities because all the corporates have got this corporate social responsibility. Now, recently, the past five years, institutional social responsibility is also getting very popular and the institutions are sensitized towards implementing this institutional social responsibility. So towards this, I wanted to highlight the few points. See, this ISR can be implemented at two levels. One is through the institutions, with the support of the management, we can admit students from the underprivileged society or the children of the destitute women or children of the war widows. So we can be able to admit the students, the deserved students in institutions with free education. That is the one way, the, the support of the management we can do. And the other way, the support of technological intervention immediately. It is actually giving an experience for our students, learning experience for students. So they are improving their learning skills. They are improving their practical knowledge by incorporating their technological intervention in the various problems which is prevailing in the society. So let me stop with this, and the next round I'll make tell you a few more points in what way we have covered the nearby villages. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Shashi. Uh, wonderful to know that your uh, seven core values add up to inspire, and I think important point you make about last mile connectivity, last mile impact, that what you do, is it really reaching the last person it is intended for. Wonderful. So from Shashi, we move Ram back to you, again to the north. A lot of news from your state this, this last days and some exceptional effort that uh, has inspired the whole country. So you come from there. Talk to us about your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, thanks, Rajita. So um, I think uh, uh, it's, a, it's a rather large panel, and I think some of the points that I've wanted to speak have already been covered. So um, let me think a little um, uh, kind of impromptu, so to say, and then bring a few more elements on the table, which I feel 
were kind of not covered. So one is that the topic says institutional, social responsibility, and then values and actions. I mean, kind of aligning values to institutional social responsibility. Now, all the colleagues have touched upon academic institutions, right? If I expand the scope of the de definition of uh, institution, then I would want to include society as an institution, uh, corporates, uh, public institutions, private institutions, social sector institutions, and so on. So therefore, the kind of the scope of the topic itself gets a little more kind of broader. The second is that when it comes to social responsibility or sustainability or planet or climate or whichever issue that we discuss about, is it, I would question that, is it only the responsibility of a university? Really not. I mean, university cannot solve these issues alone. I mean, all the institutions need to work in tandem and work together uh, in some sense. Now, fundamentally, universities or academic institutions, what we are supposed to do uh, are three things. Either, I mean, we do teaching and learning, which is our core. Uh, we do research, which essentially is um, kind of towards solving a, a certain problem, which is also kind of an act of responsibility because uh, those problems essentially are geared uh, or solution of those problems are geared towards socially responsible behavior and service essentially, I mean, as a university, generally the resources that we have is our people. I mean, um, I mean it, it does become hard for us as, an, as academic institutions to kind of generate huge surpluses like the way other institutions would. Uh, so, I, I mean, on that front, possibly it would be hard for us to kind of sustain ourselves uh, and also kind of create more resources for the other institutions that I mentioned that we can spend more cash towards kind of social responsibility. So for example, a corporate social responsibility would, like, would look like very differently than possibly a university social responsibility. Now, by the, by the very definition of it, the Sanskrit word for a university is Vishwavidyalaya, which means a school for the, for the entire world. So there is a philanthropy which is inbuilt, it is inherent in the definition of the university and any action, every action that we do you know, at the university, whether it is inside the classroom or outside the classroom, is towards social responsibility. I mean, a, uh, we would possibly never hear of a socially irresponsible university. I mean, universities are always socially responsible. Now the point uh, that, that brings me to is that any act that the university does, teaching, research, teaching learning, service, or research, it requires resources. I mean, I, I keep mentioning this um, um, at, at different forums, and I mean, I'm, I'm taking liberty to deviate a little from the topic, but I feel that is, that is relevant for this topic, is that where does the money come from, right? As universities, where do we get that money? And therefore, one is university's responsibility towards uh, social kind of um, behavior. What are the responsibility of the other institutions in the society, whether it is society at large, government, industry, um, and so on? What is their responsibility towards kind of uh, universities um, as such and kind of solving the problems uh, that universities are trying to solve? I mean, one of the things that we are um, kind of proposing, I mean, we would talk a little about certain specific initiatives that we have taken at the university subsequently, but one thing right now we are working on is that how does the other institutions taken together create those resources for the academic institutions? And right now we are in the process of writing a paper which essentially proposes that what if we create um, um, a kind of mechanism um, like, for example, a stock market for academic institutions where they get listed and they get access to public money where public institutions, society, government, all of them, they come together. Government's role is more to kind of set up a regulatory framework, whereas uh, society, individuals, philanthropists, they all could kind of provide that those kinds of resources to academic institutions so that therefore they could meet their social responsibility missions with a lot of zeal and rigor, which otherwise we don't have. I mean, we don't have honestly money or even time, for example, if you see, I mean, everybody has a huge pressure of producing research output, producing kind of accreditation results, rankings, and whatnot. And therefore, however much one wishes to do a lot more work on this front, 
it does take a back seat in reality. So with that, I think I'll hand over to Yes, Nidhi. Actually, Ram, you brought out the very important topic of resources. Um, while it is easy for us to say that there is no end to how much we can do, we are all uh, limited by resources of all kinds, human resources, financial resources, and you bring that out. That's, that's very relevant. And that's why Nidhi is the perfect transition for us to make. Nidhi, you come from the private sector, and you run a foundation yourself. Talk to us about how the private sector can do more, or what else can it do? And what, what can it do to partner better with academia to m take this ahead? Thank you so much. And um, you know, backbenchers are a little more creative when you have to speak at the end. Uh, so I'll kind of add on, I think <clears throat> we've had um, very good inputs already. Um, coming as a practitioner to this panel, uh, while you know we already kind of get great insights from academicia, the research. But when we get to ground, and um, that's what we do, we uh, do and live corporate social responsibility, or rather say, socio-economic, environmental development. Uh, uh, several projects, or I would say, several impact-bound <clears throat> work is done by us on ground. And that's when we often kind of see certain role that Surely, institutions which are playing a great role in building the character of uh, any country or, let's say, uh, who are sitting on mine of wealth of young human resource can contribute. And we always look forward to them. Many, many of them come and intern with us. And often when they come, when we send them to remote communities, uh, when we send them to slums or rural areas, uh, we are kind of, you know, uh, taken aback uh, with the kind of exposure that they've never had uh, in their life about the realities uh, of many communities still, though we are uh, a booming economy and lots is happening. But there are communities which are left out. There's lots to be done in the environmental area. Uh, I mean, at times, the life that they live on campuses somewhere disconnects them. Uh, and that's where uh, we as practitioners always say that connect with reality somehow. Dedicate certain hours of your curriculum which need to be mandatory. Because without that, um, possibly we are building a youth dividend which may not come back uh, in, in the same way or which may not contribute to the gaps which we still have towards the SDG agenda. So while uh, people, peace, planet, partnerships, you know, the, the entire preamble towards which now the world is working, the 2030 agenda, I think India has this 40% plus youth dividend, which is a great opportunity. So often we wonder that how do we really inculcate that in the regular? It could be demography, it could be epidemiology, it could be research, it could be ethics. So there are certain things at individual level. So what is it we can do at an individual level, which is at our own? So just to give you an example, in HCL, uh, I am heading HCL Foundation, but the company HCL Tech had 250, has 250,000 people. So we run this campaign called Power of One. And that's nothing. Each individual is contributing a rupee or three or five or ten per day from their payroll. And they have dedicated couple of hours per year, and this is beyond the 2% resources and a team of 500 which works with HCL Foundation or 200 plus, which are regular programs which have certain project-driven approaches, and we fully understand that in a busy student life, to undertake that much may not be possible. But power of one kind of simple funds can be run because at the end of the day, sustainability in anything we take up, the word itself is social. So there is some responsibility and some accountability here. So we do see a lot of students, they come in with a lot of enthusiasm, but how many stay back and take it up in extremely measurable matrices where we can say, okay, yes, X, Y, Z number of students have been educated or skill development programs have been done or startups have been capacitated or so many saplings have been planted, so many water bodies have been taken up. Um, you know, even small projects, 
for example, filling up forms for youth, which is finding difficult to get into mainstream job. Can certain universities just help them with information technology, etc., etc.? So we have these mine and mine of, you know, I would say unmet needs, uh, where we really look forward to young people coming and joining us. Um, we get interns from very prestigious universities and when they come and when, they, when we enthusiastically uh, welcome them and uh, invite them to small and big programs, they do wonders. But I think those platforms are also missing. So I would also request other CSRs to let the interns come in because those internships will turn. So those partnerships, as you rightly said, are critical between hardcore practitioners and the academicia. So I'll end there, and, but, but what, what I want to mention here is that practical connects are needed and practical projects are needed for them to be able to participate and be, as they say, ZNZ needs to be challenged, otherwise they'll not come right. on board. Right. Now, wonderful, Nidhi, you brought out a very important point of are our students, our youth disconnected from reality? Uh, I will tell a small uh, personal story, you know, when I, in the initial years of our university, one time I was doing a town hall and some students came to me and said, ma'am, in this patch of the land, there is no lights. So we were looking at that and we say, yeah, we have to install some more street lights. And that evening we were uh, going for a program because we had a program of distributing solar lights in villages. And we went to a village, not, not more than three, four kilometers from our campus, which never had light. And we had to use the headlights of our cars to do even the function. So when we came back from that program, these same students came to me and said, ma'am, it's OK, you know, that little less light is not a problem. So that realizing the perspective to the reality of the world, I think very crucial what you brought out. Before I go back to the panel with a first sort of round of questions, I, you know, all of us here are representing some institution, whether it's a university or any other institution. How many of us are involved in some kind of social, social activity for our institution? Can you show with a show of hands? All right. Uh, I want one more show of hands. How much do you, if you had to rate low, medium, high, how many of you think in your institutions the, the, the focus on social responsibility is low? It's okay, we are not being recorded or reported low. How many of you think it's medium? Medium, okay. How many of you think it's high? Very nice. So this is sort of a meter for us because we are a microcosm of the macrocosm. I think it shows us where we stand and where we need to move. And you, uh, Dr. Ranjan, I will come back to you. You spoke about creating a multiplier effect. Tell us how can we create that multiplier effect? There will be challenges. Some practical ideas from you on how we can do that in our institutions. Do you have a mic? Does it work? Just no. You can take it. Thank you. Yes, so I'd like to take a couple of examples, real world examples, as to illustrate how this multiplier effect can work. But first, we have to start with what is the problem that we are solving. Right? So the first problem that the panelists came up with was this resource problem. Right? Resource challenge with allocation of resources for this kind of a social responsible projects. So one example that we do is we have started at uh, IIIT Delhi a digital Delhi conclave, which is nothing but a platform where we bring in academicians, researchers, people from industry, policy makers, and other people from the community. All they do is they have they choose one SDG goal and spend the whole day discussing how to solve the problems around it. And at the end, we come out with a white paper. Now, this white paper is fairly useful for the people in, in Delhi government who often take use, make use of it to kind of influence the policies. This is not too high an investment, but it has found a lot of acceptance. This is one way you create a multiplier effect. That's example number one. Number two is, you have to have buy-in from people. Now, social responsibility is not all charity. You are creating value. And if you are creating value, you have to find people who will back you. 
So another case in hand is we said we look, look at the problem in Delhi in terms of this public transport. And we went to you know, the state government and said that, look, we'll help you solve this problem. You give us a seed funding. And we started the Center of Excellence in Sustainable Mobility, which helps uh, you know, uh, people to, the buses to plan their routes and uh, look at the most efficient way to transport. It is actually deputed on the ground. Similarly, De Delhi Knowledge and Development Fund gave us some funding to start a center of excellence in healthcare. Now, is that a multiplier effect? Big time, yes, because that's where we also have a possibility of training the doctors also, and that creates a multiplier effect to that effect. So these are some of the examples where either the institute puts in its own resources to, to begin with. Multiplier means you have to seed it. But once you seed it, the multiplier effect, the avalanche effect must take over. Uh, there's another example of finding the dark spots uh, in Delhi where we kind of did a project where all the street lights, which, whether the bulb is on or on, can be seen on a dashboard. And you can find out where the dark areas are. And you can help make the city safer for women in that respect. These are research-based projects which is creating a big impact on the ground. There are a couple of more examples, but I'll take a pause here. Dr. Ranjan, that's really fantastic examples. And uh, I was, I mean, I, I don't think many of us were aware of what you did for the dark spots. One more thing to put on your table and your generous heart is something about the air quality in Delhi. So we can also come more often. So please take that as a small uh, idea for future consideration. So from you, Dr. Ramakrishnan, you spoke about helping students move above and beyond the four Ps and making uh, social responsibility more sustainable, not keep it tactical. Talk to us more about what you do. We know uh, from our association with Dr. Vidya how Symbiosis has really created Pune as a township to be, uh, you know, um, the Oxford of the East. Oxford of the East, yeah. We say in Marathi, Pune Tithe Kai Une, means where there is Pune, there is nothing lacking. So tell us what you are doing there. Great. So how we at Symbiosis make it sustainable? I told that it should be above and beyond just a tactical activity. When our founder, Dr. H.P. Mujumdar, found Symbiosis, he told the world is one family. Now, uh, linking it to this uh, theme, aligning values with actions, uh, when uh, Dr. Mujumdar thought of uh, you know this concept, he, he created symbiosis for the benefit of foreign students. So now I'm not getting into that, but we're talking about how we are inculcating the aspect of sustainable uh, uh, social responsibility in our students. One, we have got four credits specifically allocated for this aspect in our curriculum. So that way, there are credits that are allocated for social responsibility. We got uh, a center called SCOPE. Now, SCOPE is Symbiosis Community Outreach Program and Extension Activities, where this particular activity is for 14 villages, and the students gain credits by going ahead and associating themselves in this project of SCOPE, where there are two vans. One is a health van, the other is a digital literacy van, which goes to all these villages, and the students get associated, and there is a digital curriculum that has been set up, so that this curriculum is imparted to students who are there who don't have access to internet, to other digital gadgets that uh, these uh, students who are studying in the university have, making them understand and ensure that they learn. Now, this is sustainable because batch after batch, we also have uh, metrics to see that how many individuals were benefited of it, and what is the curriculum that has got covered by this batch so that the next batch can then take the next part of the curriculum. So this becomes sustainable. So batch after batch, again, different set of students, different set of participants, and that is all having its own way to go and see how we are tracking it. Now, coming back to the digital, uh, coming back to the health van, it's kind of an ambulance with the do doctor and medicines which goes all the way to all these 14 villages. Again, ensuring that healthcare is provided. Again, we have a, a medical college, a women's only medical college. We got a nursing school. Students from these are actually tied up to this activity so that they are sensitized to this aspect as well. And that is again integrated to the credit part of it. So they go ahead, earn the credits at the same time. This also becomes sustainable. So if you look at uh, the aspects which I talked about, just not one joy of giving week, just take something, donate. These activities which I'm speaking right now are not of the, the kind of activities of one time. It is continuous, 
it is measurable and we have metrics to measure them and we see how did, how did this activity create a change in those 14 villages and you're talking about 14 villages so it's large so it cannot be completed in one beat one year it's a sustainable activity so this is what again connecting to the philosophy of the world is one family if the university is located at a, at a particular place and we have got 14 villages and we are trying to go and connect and go ahead uh, do something to that village with the help of students uh, and it is connected to their credit, it becomes sustainable as well. And they get exposed because the other aspect of this Gen Z, someone was talking about, you know, uh, the practical connect. I think uh, uh, Nidhi. Nidhi was talking about. So here is a practical connect of how the students actually get connected to the practical aspects and then go ahead and take up. Let me again end here. So they also look at the problems of sanitation there the problems of having you know, uh, electricity there. Then they think of innovative projects. Can we go ahead and do something so that it helps them? So there was a project that was created by a set of students telling how I can ensure that uh, these villages get some source of light. Again, a solar-based project which gets charged, and this was again, uh, uh, you know, appreciated by the ex-president of India. A set of students created something like this. So they also get exposed to the practical problems and challenges that are there while they go ahead with these projects, and that gives them the idea to be innovative to so solve the problems which are there. Next is about the water problem that is there, the, the potable water. So again, another project telling how will we ensure that with minimum cost, we create something so that the portable water is given. So while we expose these students with this structured way of going ahead and you know involving in these activities, they also get an opportunity to look at the problems and possibly think of solutions to those problems. So that is something which is, again, a unique, which is a byproduct of this particular activity that we thought we, we have taken about, right? Wonderful, really great examples, again, practical practical examples for each of us to, you know, uh, take back ideas and... Hello? Yeah, I perfectly relate uh, to the ethos you're coming from because even in our institution, Vasudeva Kutumbakam is the basis of our life. And Hello? Yeah, it kind of comes and goes. Now you can hear me. So, uh, is the basis of our life, and we've saw, we've seen that. Actually, uh, Dr. Ramkrishnan, I'm sure you'll agree that this also thing to the intellect of the student develops problem-solving uh, capabilities, develops complex problem-solving connection abilities, and I think it is in a way coming back to the academic uh, uh, aspect of uh, our teaching learning process. So, Richard, moving to you, you spoke about how you are helping you institutions develop better outcomes and even related to SDGs. So can you expand that further and can you talk to us about how a business uh, council like yours uh, help create socio-economic impact, demographic impact uh, in, in a long term? And you, you live in Goa, uh, which is a beautiful place, but also has a lot of opportunity uh, for development uh, in such areas. So talk to us more about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll come at this from a sort of different angle, I suppose, from the sort of more corporate side of the conversation. Um, I think there's a number of ways that the foreign institutions, and I speak for foreign institutions in this conversation, can have impact in India um, uh, in terms of development and SDG um, activities. So um, just the very fact that so many foreign universities are really excited about the Indian opportunity, about being in India, about the higher education landscape in India, especially post recent reforms, means that I think you, know, you are seeing much more appetite for them to bring uh, courses to India, which can, you know, some of them have excellent um, ESG and sustainability courses and um, uh, that kind of thing. Then you've got some uh, quite practical examples where, um, for example, the University of Birmingham. So University of Birmingham is a good example here because they've got a good um, uh, sort of program with IIT Madras where they are doing um, AI uh, master's degree where the student gets um, a, a, doctor, um, a degree from both institutions. But, but beyond that, they're doing so much more in India. So for example, they are working on um, electrification of Indian railways with the Indian railways to help use um, better data, anal data analytics to actually reduce uh, uh, accidents and improve maintenance for electrification with Indian Railways. And they're also opening up 
uh, a number of centres of excellence with two states in India, I think Telangana and Haryana, centres of excellence for cooling to help with food security and refrigeration of, of, of food. Um, so those are, those are two, um, two examples that I have. I mean, I do think on a broader level here, the really important thing is that the, the, the movement of people between foreign universities and Indian universities in both directions is really important. And I don't think, um, you know, there's a good story here with India going to the UK, but we need so, so, so much more UK and other foreign students to come to India because how India deals with these problems is how the world's going to deal with some of these problems. And I don't feel, certainly from a UK perspective, that, that our young people have anything like enough understanding of how important and how relevant and how dynamic this country is and where it's heading. I'll leave it there. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's great, I think. Problems of food security, problems of uh, poverty elevation, uh, gender inequality are very real. And I think many things happening in India in that direction. Vishal, if you don't mind, I'm going to Shashi because she has a flight to catch just in case we get and she has to leave. So Shashi, you spoke about Inspire as your core values, seven core values. How are you cascading that to your 20,000 students so that they get aligned to it and then can take forward the, the, the intent that you have? So as I already told, our curriculum integrates the community uh, problems. So a few of our subjects in every semester has got a problem solving um, papers. So where the complex engineering problems are real time problems which are identified in the nearby villages are given to the students. Uh, the, it is the responsibility of the teachers who identify the problems along with the students and along and the, they formulate the teams and the teams solve the problems at the end before the end of the their course so this this is the way we are importing the social we are making the curriculum socially relevant and we are uh, uh, giving the opportunity for the students as a part of the outcome based education you all know that outcome based education the institutions needs to practice or the students needs to solve complex engineering problems we are finding out these problems from these uh, problems in the villages. So for example, so in, we are uh, living near Chennai, as a nearby suburbs are uh, most thickly populated and there is a problem of mosquito. It is very common in uh, most of the cities. In suburbs of uh, Chennai, it is mosquito is a common problem. So we have taken this as an uh, issue and uh, we have discussed with our uh, science students and engineering students and we found out a solution. Now we, now we have found a solution called a nano formulated uh, uh, solution and that solution we are supply, it is a solution, it's a nano formulated solution, it is uh, with the support of the collector of the particular uh, village and with the support of our uh, village officers, we are now spraying that uh, solution to the nearby village, it is controlling the mosquito larvae population in those villages. So this is one of the problem we identified and we solved. Similarly, so we, uh, nearby, uh, in Pondicherry is also near to our uh, institution at, at, at around 140 to 2200 kilometers. We identified certain lakes and uh, we have now cleared those lakes and then those lakes waters are now ready for, uh, so we, are, we made the lake, lake water the portable water. So this is all the, the support of the management and the support of the students. We could able to make those type of uh, support to the nearby villages. So apart from that, so in uh, within 350 kilometers from our institution is a uh, hill called Javadi Hills, it's where we have uh, around uh, 12,000 ST population. So though the people of those villages are migrant workers and uh, they are not getting access to technologies, they are not getting access to the transport, uh, schools and uh, healthcare services. It is actually because of the distance, the location, even government of Tamil Nadu is couldn't able to concentrate much and uh, it was mostly neglected place. We identified that village and with the support of DST and uh, we have made an agri innovation hub and we are now educating the farmers of villages to improve their agricultural yield and how to produce and how to make value added products from their they are the mainly they are uh, cultivating millets from the millets now the millets uh, demand is more and we are educating them and we are making them to directly sell those producers with the support of the platform we developed for them is a javadi fresh 
and then from the millets we are making we are uh, training them to make uh, cakes uh, biscuits and selling them the online platform similarly lot of uh, uh, ntft products like uh, non timber forest products are also there and they are uh, bringing from the forest and they are selling to the middle level agents we that also we identified and uh, we are now making them with the support of our, our uh, labs we set up the lab there improve, and we are testing the uh, quality of the honey they are bringing from the uh, hill and uh, packing those uh, honey and with this uh, brand of javadi fresh they are now they are selling those uh, producers in that way in the institution is supporting the villages it, this particular work we are doing for the st population of those villages similarly in kalalur district we founded the sc population so for them also we are doing the similar kind of activities so like that uh, with the support of uh, dst with the support of the institution with the support of uba so ub through uba we have adopted five villages and with the support of few little funding from uba this i50000 and 1 lakh and with the support of the institution we have developed a lot of technologies for the benefit of those villages like small chatbot for improving the malnutrition in the uh, women in those villages and then a health kiosk uh, to um, to uh, measure their health parameters so it's like a atm machine the uh, villages can go and stand and it will uh, to the investment non investment methods the parameters of those their health parameters can be monitored so this kind of small small initiatives with the support of the students and faculty we are doing those villages we consider this as Uh, social responsibility and it is actually giving a value addition to the curriculum and it, it is improving the students skill sets and uh, they are also exploring lot of uh, uh, problems which are prevailing the society and thereby institution and uh, the students are contributing to the society thank you wow. wonderful guys you can clap they are sharing such amazing uh, practical examples uh, everybody who is adding back uh, to you know to their communities and rajesh it's a request these are such excellent stories that maybe we should do a compendium of best practices of all participating institutions i think it will be a very big treasure trove and shashi next time we want some of these cakes cookies which you're talking about millet cookies and uh, either we come to you or you bring them to us yeah no great great examples and vishal with that i come to you 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 really raise the basic question of what is the purpose of our existence and so how are you uh, you know uh, in fact our uh, founder pooja gurudev always says that uh, to have the question only on what is the purpose of your life is the answer to it because that's a journey it is there is no answer to it the the question is the journey so talk to us about how you are infusing that into the journey of your students life so i think placement week is on so depending on whether it's <laughs> non placement week my answers will be different what is yeah, the yeah. purpose of our existence right. right now for this week the purpose of existence is this you right. see how much <laughs> yeah but by and large i think uh, a lot of the very nice examples that have been given here uh, are very much what will help us build the thoughts uh, and essentially the motivate motivation for action for a certain base of people we are a higher education institutions i'm glad that a lot of uh, primary secondary schools now are creating a lot of um, you know understanding in the i'm not, i don't know whether every one of them is but i would imagine a lot of the um, you know uh, school structure is enabling certain deeper reflection if this if this was available to us a long time ago then um, you know maybe uh, things would have been a little bit more different but i think i'm glad that this is happening at the school level now but as far as higher education is concerned i think uh, we could look at higher education uh, from the perspective of social responsibility and also from a perspective of okay we don't necessarily have that those kind of budgets but i think we should also look at ourselves as a as as a platform where we can enable a lot more people to engage with each other which are beyond the the you know the the institution itself right so whether that be industry whether that be ngos whether that be other stakeholders whether that be federations whether that be government bodies whoever else i think um, an educational institution normally is a is a non partisan um, you know platform that can be used to create a lot more magic at scale right uh, so to give you an example here i think for us we have a center for sports research uh, what that center does is looks at sports as a mechanism for socio economic mobility it adopts villages it trains provides nutrition uh, knowledge of nutrition make sure that those kids are uh, let's say competing at district level state level and then beyond tracking their development 
That same sports research center enables uh, an MOU or a collaboration with the All India Football Federation. Why? Because All India Football Federation wants the kind of skill sets we have to understand how do I improve my grassroots penetration? How do I ensure that football becomes a much more popular sport in a country like ours? Uh, at the same time, um, you know, we are working with other universities because traditional sports and research around traditional sports is important, right? So we work with public universities, central universities in Rajasthan or in UP to be able to once again uh, enable our own skill set, you know, deeper research, analytical research, work around traditional sports, their connections with modern sports and so on and so forth. So that's one aspect of why this whole idea of why we exist uh, possibly comes in or public value. At the same time, you know, for us, um, entrepreneurship uh, or being able to look at teaching through entrepreneurship and not just teaching about entrepreneurship as, as a major focus for us. And for us, the whole catchment area is, 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 is that region, you know, beyond Ghaziabad, you know, going to Meerut and, you know, many of those regions wherein we would like to enable, enable, strengthen, bring in, mentor a lot of very, very, you know, young startups to come along and get that kind of guidance, possibly get some funding and move on. And I think that's where that multiplier effect possibly also comes in, what, you know, Dr. Ranjan was talking about. Uh, at the same time, we have the Center for Enterprise and Business Improvement, which works with small and very micro enterprises on problems which are, you know, pertinent problems that are important for them to be able to solve. Uh, why do we do it? Because the faculty get, gets involved. Why do we do it? Because the students get involved. And the reason, uh, you know, why is it an advantage to us? It's not just about that small enterprise, but learning becomes so much more effective in the classroom and beyond. So uh, these are some of the measures that we've, you know, we currently take our SSR initiative, you know, social responsibility initiative that's touched the lives of so many different, uh, very, very, very small micro entrepreneurs all across the country. And you know, it's 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 rather successful. It's in its sixth, seventh year, and you know, it's 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 going great guns. So these are the kind of initiatives that uh, we actually take. And coming back to that, you know, fundamental question, you know, this is where public value comes in, right? You would notice that a lot of uh, students at you know business schools all across the world, not just in India, they're loath to you know think about NGOs as a as an option. They're loath to think about public sector as an option. And this is where, if you're able to try and re reframe their thought process, you know that's half the battle won. I think that's where a lot of the skill set that a business school graduate has, um, you know, is required, and not just let's say only in corporate sectors and and stuff like that. Very, very well said, Vishal. I think the core uh, quintessence from all the effort that you're doing is a multi-stakeholder approach. Involve everybody because everything is a collective problem for us to solve. Wonderful, wonderful examples and uh, initiatives that you're running. So Ram, coming to you, you again challenged us to expand the definition of an institution beyond pure academic institution. You raised the question of the resources. Uh, you are still doing a lot. Tell us more about this idea of stock market of universities. Uh, have you thought that through or is it just fresh? Tell us more. Yeah, so it's a, it's a work in progress. We are um, writing an uh, opinion piece, uh, uh, me and one of the leading economists in India. So, um, so I think before that, um, I'll, I'll quickly touch upon uh, the, the three, four structural things that we are doing at the university. Uh, also add a point to what Ranjan mentioned. Um, so one is that, of course, as universities, we do kind of involve into a lot of problem-solving projects, um, seed money here and there with whatever uh, limited resources we have, both faculty, students, and money. Uh, but, but, you know, a, a very famous academic once said that there is a risk uh, when institutions start solving problems where money is available, right? Because then... Um, you know, everybody starts running after the funding where the funding is available. And in that process, many of the important problems are remain or left unsolved or unaddressed rather. And therefore, I keep um, kind of highlighting this need of having money also made available for blue ocean work that is being done, uh, which is also used for future proofing. I mean, uh, our, as, as academic institutions, our role is not to solve today's problems. As academic institutions, our role also, also is to kind of foresee the problems that society might face uh, in, in, in years to come and train our students because they would be citizens of a society where they would be facing those problems which we don't see today. But then kind of they should be able to kind of read the kind of indications and then pick up those indicators and then kind of work on solving those problems 
kind of future proofing, so to say. Um, so there are three, four structural things that we've done at the university. End of first year, every student at the university goes and work with a social sector entity. We have partnered with almost uh, more than 1,000 NGOs across India. Um, uh, six to eight weeks of mandatory internship with every student. Uh, and they choose one of the NGOs in 17 SDGs. Um, and they go and get exposed to how a social sector work, what their challenges are, how do they get money from, what is the problem that they are trying to solve, how does it feel like living a life with less than a dollar a day uh, with a family in India, and so on. And uh, I, I'm happy to share that this year, for example, we are contributing two million men and women hours for the service of the nation and community. Uh, I, I feel it's kind of incredible. The second year, uh, uh, all our students should go and work with a government sector entity or a startup. Again, they should, because government uh, touches upon every aspect of life, no matter what, what any citizen would do, whether it is a business or kind of a job or a, or a social sector, um, anything. And therefore, they should know how kind of government functions, what are the constraints in which government work with, et cetera. Um, and, and it could be any level, from panchayat level to a union government level. They choose, and then they go and intern with government. Or they go and work with startups. Then, then they come back. When they come back, every student has to undergo a course which we have designed, which is Start Your Startup. Mm -hmm. And that helps them link back with the social sector problems that, that they kind of got exposed to, and the kind of startup slash government kind of way of working and looking at problems that they got exposed to. And many of them, they get kind of excited about uh, launching their startups, uh, social sector startups, as well as um, kind of uh, profit kind of driven startups. And both are welcome. Uh, by virtue of providing them end-to-end -end support, we take 2% equity in every startup. Um, and right now, we are kind of trying to incubate about 100 startups a year which means that next five years, we would have about 2% equity in 500 startups. Um, and university's equity would also go. Hopefully, it would result into a good endowment for us, which would provide us some kind of good resources that we'll be able to kind of invest into the Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean projects uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and, and I mean, everything else, for example, credits for startups and all kinds of things which are there, and which I will not spend a lot of time on. But coming to the, uh, to the stock market thing that you mentioned, and I was thinking that um, where should ac academic institutions get money from, right? And it's not that society would not want to help academic institutions, because generally, academic institutions are doing social good. Um, for example, um, uh, Nidhi mentioned a very good point that HCL employees, for example, they are contributing whatever, five rupees, 10 rupees, 50 rupees, whatever they can pay in a day and creating a corpus, so to say. Now, once this money is there with society, how does the mem how, how does a member of society know that who's the rightful recipient of this money, right? And that's the kind of question that we are trying to ask that people would possibly want to give money, but there has to be a regulatory mechanism. There has to be a forum on which people have confidence and faith in that the institutions that are listed on that forum are credible institutions, and the money that will be given for that purpose will be utilized fully for the purpose for which the money was given. And there'll be no profiteering making made out of that money, right? And therefore, we are thinking that, can we create, uh, for example, scholarship bonds, like the way GSACs or corporate bonds, right? And poor students could be subsidized, uh, get quality education on a subsidy by philanthropy, I mean, social, Society does philanthropy for um, the, the children who cannot uh, afford fee. The problem in expecting that institutions will give scholarships is, uh, is riskier proposition because if as a private institution I do not charge my students, how would I pay kind of salaries to my staff and faculty members? Uh, and if I don't pay uh, kind of competitive salaries to my staff and faculty members, I would not be able to attract and retain quality faculty members, which would then result into a kind of subpar or below par quality of education that I will be providing. And therefore, I will not be able to produce uh, or provide an experience to a student which would make them better problem solvers. So it has a spiraling effort if I expect everything from institutions to do, provide scholarships and provide a low cost education and so on. And therefore, we are kind of creating a construct that, that kind of brings uh, a fairness, a transparency, 
uh, a regulatory mechanism and a trust kind of in the society that if they invest, uh, I mean, um, into those institutions, then those institutions would enter it into, into a multiplier kind of effect. Uh, we, we also looked at a case study, which is very interesting, is that if you were to invest 100 rupees into any, let's say, um, share, for example, and you know that you will get, let's say, 10% uh, return, right? Versus you have to invest, let's say, 100 rupees in a green fund, right? Which would possibly give you 9.9% .9 interest, right? Theoretically, where would you kind of invest, right? Possibly the answer would be that, okay, 0.1% interest is fine, and you would possibly in invest into green funds. Then the question comes that, what if you know the person? I mean, let's say if your cousin is asking for an investment and the cousin is promising 9.8% interest, then where do you invest? Now, interestingly, from an economist's point of view, green funds, despite being green funds, I mean, they are, they are, they are kind of more environmentally conscious, but their returns are better than kind of non-green funds. And therefore, it has a far more social merit in kind of thinking of a construct that why can't we think of creating education funds like green funds and therefore kind of larger society kind of provides money to academic institutions so that they are able to better fulfill their social responsibilities. Thanks, Ram. Again, great, great ideas. And again, one request, uh, Pank, uh, Rajesh, is that this is like a treasure trove of uh, new ideas. So we should have a longer master classes maybe on success sharing and, you know, because so much we can learn from each other. Love the idea that you mandate one year intern with a startup, one year with a government agency. I think we are kind of running almost out of time and one of our panelists had to leave for a flight. So, Nidhi, in a couple of quick minutes, um, all of us sitting here have large hearts and very good intent to do good for, uh, uh, for our society. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, just two minutes. And you have big purses coming from the private sector. How can we bridge this gap? No, I think wonderful. And as I said, that uh, it's, it's a mine of opportunities. And if these connects could be formalized and some kind of governance could be set around, uh, surely we can bridge so many gaps. Um, I, I already that we, we offer internships. But what we are also trying to do is that a lot of knowledge that we generate at times through implementing the projects on ground, because we work from maternal mortality to infant to non-communicable diseases to, you know, children. I mean, so, so, so what I, so see, when we have these certain issues are very visible, like electrification and so on. But then there are a lot of inherent issues inside the society, gender, inclusion, the larger construct, vulnerability mapping. So it starts getting very technical, so as to say, and one really needs to understand nuances to be able to deliver better. So I think one is the connect between CSRs and academicia to just exchange knowledge, which is what is needed on ground. So it's not rocket science, at the end of the day, we really need to un understand the SDGs, we need to understand the indicators to measure, we need to understand the human rights framework, the COP is on right now, COP28, I think a lot of people are already there, what is happening in these conventions, what is our commitment, how can we, so we really need to fast forward our thinking and applied knowledge. So like, for example, we run this course on CSR and its applied aspects on our own academy, which is being offered free of cost and anyone can join it. But then there is this whole bridging the gap in terms of being able to do it in a sustained way and in a measurable way. So one is exchanging knowledge, no one is stopping us and that can happen at a wide level through some structured programming across universities. The second is, Commitment on dedication. Resources is one thing. In fact, I was looking at uh, some of the examples that came from uh, Satyabhama Institute. I mean, amazing. I mean, obviously, some of us would want to fund some of that if, because that's also possible under, under CSR in terms of scaling it up. Because these are innovations, incubations that might just remain limited to 10 villages, 14 villages, where the unmet need is very, very high. So I think it's also about us combining uh, or let's say partner, uh, partnering around certain challenges which could be run in a sustained basis and CSRs could come together and 
rather commit to it for a longer duration of time pick up 10 from the list whatever i mean there's so many issues there's no dearth of issues but then commit to it partner public private partnership would be critical we'll not be able to do anything without government because resources are resting there accountability is also resting there so how do we bring in the state government the the district level the block level machinery with us and make it very very practical and real and let's understand youth is very intelligent they they are extremely intelligent people they have technology with them and they will only get charged when they see the results happening one aspect i really want to mention here is that it is also mutually beneficial because youth is also getting lost without real time purposes and the um i think uh, which they are facing in their day to day lives where if they are coupled with good social response or rather say developmental socio economic environmental developmental programming would be mutually beneficial for them as well to really feel good and purposeful wonderful i think we could go on but many indications that we have to stop i would really like to thank and congratulate all our panelists for such bringing uh, the heart of their institutions here with us a big hand uh, for all of you i had something planned for all of you but i cannot do it now because of the time restriction but thank you for being such a great audience thanks a lot Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. We thank our eminent panel for such a wonderful session that we had. I would request all our panelists to kindly step forward, come together for a group photograph. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move towards the closing session of the summit. Once again, a huge thank you to all our eminent panelists for a wonderful session. I think a very nice session to end the summit with. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the concluding session, may I invite on stage Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, Chair, FIKI Higher Education Committee, and Dr. Rajesh Pankaj, Director and Head Education and Skills, FIKI. So over to you, ma'am, for the concluding remark. So this is just a formality that I think I will end this uh, wonderful two days of uh, the FIKI Higher Education Summit. We look forward to seeing you next year. I think uh, one person uh, or uh, his team that we've not made a mention of is Dr. Rajesh. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Pankaj who's really taken a lot of efforts. I think we, he needs a great uh, round of applause, at least from the people who are present here and many who have gone back. So. Looking forward to seeing you all at the next uh, Higher Education Summit. We plan to prepone it and we also plan to have a more consultative view from all the members of the FIKI for the topics uh, and of course the kind of discussions that will take place. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you all. Uh, uh, great uh, two and a half days of deliberation started off on 28th evening with the Vice Chancellor CEO Roundtable ended today seven impactful sessions, of course. So there are a lot of insights that we got from uh, various participants, few of whom have been kind of participating uh, for the last few years, and we've taken all of that into account. Uh, we would only want to improve upon and going forward kind of try and curate it uh, in a more effective and a more uh, focused manner. We'll kind of try and kind of add few strands to it, and then you know, make it more engaging uh, in the coming years. 
And of course, around the year, there's so much of work that we do. I mean, we'll be happy because there are many participants who've been coming over here. So summit is one of the things that we do. But the large objective, of course, is to bring in reform. The larger objective, of course, is to bring in the overhauling so in the sector. So from that perspective, we would be happy to uh, have uh, insights from you around the clock, uh, not just to improve this conference, but also to improve the policy advocacy work that we are conventionally mandated with. So yes, uh, thank you again, and uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, next year, uh, hopefully in the month of October 2024. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and ladies and gentlemen. With that, once again, I take this opportunity to thank all our eminent panelists, all our distinguished moderators, distinguished delegates, participants, students, everybody who took part in this summit over the two days. And ladies and gentlemen, before you leave the venue, there's a hot cup of tea and coffee and some hot snacks waiting for you on the first floor. Please join us for a cup of tea and coffee before you leave the venue. My, my due apologies, in fact, uh, I have to, at the outset, uh, thank the entire team, uh, higher education and skill development team of FIKI. Uh, I would also want to name them because it's, it's, it's because of them that we've been able to kind of put in uh, the kind of effort and work that we've been able to. So I would start with Atul. Uh, I would request him to come over on the stage. So Atul, Nagendra, uh, uh, Deepti, Amit, uh, Verges. Of course, Imani is not there. Harshita, Sahiba, uh, Jagat, Verges, Sunil. So the entire team kind of uh, put in a lot of hard work uh, uh, to ensure that we were able to kind of deliver this uh, conference. And of course, last but not the least, uh, the partners were listed out there. So all the partners have been a big support in ensuring that we're able to do this conference. Thank you all again. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for the team of higher education, FIKI, for putting up such a wonderful show. As I call them together for a group. Vidya ma'am, can you join the team, please? Dr. Vidya, you are requested to join the group photograph of the team of higher education. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we close the proceedings of the 18th Higher Education Summit of FIKI. Looking forward to seeing you all next year at the 19th. And we have given you the feedback forms on the online format. Kindly spare some time and fill in the feedback forms and send it over to us. Feedback from you will be really, really appreciated and would help us in improving our performance in our upcoming summit. Thank you very much indeed. Please join us for a cup of tea and coffee before you leave the venue. Have a wonderful day ahead. Safe drive home. Good evening and Namaskar.